Before the word, let me just give an announcement. You are a citizen of a great nation temporarily. Yep, one day you will either go to heaven with the Lord or you'll go to heaven with the Lord. <laughs> Absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord, right? So our eternal citizenship trumps all citizenships, right? But we have a temporal citizenship which our forefathers gave their lives to give us and we must be stewards over that. And so this is such a good website. I wanted to just tell you about it, take a picture of it or a screenshot of it, but don't explore it right now, please. Uh, and while that's up there, let me just announce that early voting begins on Monday, October 21st and continues to Friday, November 1st, with the exceptions of Saturday and Sunday there between the two. And then the big day of election is Tuesday, November 5th, from 7 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. So vote. You have a privilege. You have a right. If you don't, you can't complain. <laughs> As Christians, we know that honoring God means looking higher, that our lives are lived in light of a bigger purpose. And so we honor God with what we've been given, our families, our finances, our very lives. We honor him when we preserve the nation he's entrusted to us and steward our responsibility for her future. We honor God by looking higher than mere politics, acknowledging that God gave us government for our good, and treating our vote as a gift to use for His glory. As Christians, we are called to choose even when the choices are hard. So we must choose carefully, prayerfully. On this election day, will you look higher and honor God with your vote? That is the best strategy, point people to the Lord. I trust people to hear God. Why should Christians care about government and elections? Because the Bible tells us to take our government seriously. Romans 13, 1 says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, unless you don't like them. Uh, that's not in there. Let every soul, tell someone, everybody, let every soul be subject to the governing bodies. Now, they can't make you by law, blaspheme the Lord or, you know, commit a crime. But we're to be subject to governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. That doesn't mean they are God's best. That doesn't mean God is not punishing us either. It is what it is. Continues with verse two, therefore, whoever resists the authority Resist the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. The creation of man was a creation of government. God gave the first man and first woman dominion. Gave the first man a job before he gave him a wife. Ladies, take notes. He doesn't have a job. He may look fine and all, but don't get the cart ahead of the horse. Tend that garden. Guard that garden. And we know the story. He didn't do a good job of guarding the garden. Anyway, that's another story. So government starts and then people will just force you to have government. You start a ball team, all these opinions, squabbles, somebody's got to be the captain. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. Uh, the house church movement, I don't mean to shoot at them. It's a noble cause. I think they're probably paving the way for us when we have to go underground. But they'll start out with a noble cause. Nobody's in charge but Jesus. No human representatives of the Lord's leadership in this place. And sooner or later, people will force you to do something. We met some folks in Maryland, wonderful couple. They had a house church in, this, in their home. Nobody's going to be in charge and somebody brought their, their grown son who was, who was getting in the beds, in the bedrooms with his shoes on under the covers, messing up their beds, soiling their sheets, 
Somebody had to take charge. That's just it. Who knows? People are sinners. So we have to have some semblance of order. It would be great to live in a society without police, but sooner or later, you'd be forced to do something. They're around for a reason. (laughs) Not saying they're perfect. They're around for a reason. So God created government, and he created government for our good, not for our oppression, for our protection, for our good. And government officials are ministers of God. Uh, Romans 13 goes, goes on to say they don't bear the sword in vain. They are ministers of vengeance against evil. It doesn't mean they don't need to be policed. The Department of Internal Affairs is very important. And laws matter. I mean, there's the first five books of the Bible are called the books of law. Not that we live under the law, we live under grace, but the law proves that we're sinners and we need a savior. And in our nation, we choose our government leaders. Moses was appointed by God to lead Israel to freedom. And he was trying to do all the leadership himself and he was forced to raise up leaders to help him. So in his case, he was the one who voted. In our case, we are the ones who voted. And so his father-in-law made a visit to see him. We see this story in Exodus 18. His father-in-law came to see him and saw Moses functioning as a judge, sorting out people's differences. You know, your ram impregnated my sheep. Now who do the lambs belong to? So People have to have people help them sort it out. And so from sun up to sundown, this long line of folks were waiting to plead their cases with Moses. Every day, the father-in-law saw this. His name was Jethro. I don't think he had a brother named Homer. But anyway, Jethro came to see him. And so we're going to look at that story and talk about how to choose our leaders wisely. The Jethro Principles. And while I'm talking, hold your horses because your brain's going to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, please. Who promises to not tune me out? Let me finish. Let me finish. Sometimes I say things backwards, but I I get it around. Now, if I say Moses built the ark, obviously, hey, hey. The Jethro principles. We're looking at Exodus 18 verses 13 through 23. So Jethro sees this problem and verse 13 says, and so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood before Moses from morning till evening. Just this long line, you know, over a million people, million and a half or more. There's problems that develop. Your daughter eloped with my son. No, your son eloped with my daughter. You know, and they have to sort these things out. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, all the drama going on, he said, what is this thing that you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another. And I make known the statutes of God and his laws. He was getting worn out, but he was the man. Tell yourself, I'm not the man. Verse 17, so Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, said to him, the thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear themselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. Listen to your father-in-law. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people that you may bring the difficulties to God. So the most important job Moses had was to be an intercessor for the people. Bring the tough things before him. Verse 20, and then to be a teacher. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men. Can we say ability? 
such as fear God. Men of truth, can we say not liars? Honest. Hating covetousness. And place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure. And all this people will also go to their place in peace. Just needed to give the people authority, the right folks. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, So they judged the people at all times. The hard cases they brought to Moses. So he was like the Supreme Court, I guess, right? But they judged every small case for themselves. Now, there is an echo of this in Deuteronomy 1, verse 11. Moses is talking to the people. Deuteronomy is kind of a review of the law. Verse 11 May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he promised you. I don't know that he had a British accent. How can I alone bear your burdens, your problems and your burdens and your complaints? Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. Can you say not nitwits? And you answered me and said... The thing which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence. Who knows it's important for our judges to be fearless. For the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things which you should do. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that your word would come alive and that we would relate to it in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. How to choose leaders wisely. So we read that Jethro told him, moreover, you shall select from all the people. So from the people, able men, men with ability, such as fear God, men that honored God's word, had great respect for him, were in awe of God, men of truth, men that were not liars, and hating covetousness. They were not tempted to steal. They were honorable. So they would not manipulate these cases to benefit their own coffers. One of the most respected men in history to me is a governor of Texas, the youngest governor to ever take the position in Austin. He served two terms. His name was Dan Moody. And he gutted the KKK. And that made him famous as a DA. He gutted the KKK, made him famous. And he took over when Texas was in a deep problem with corruption. Remember the story of Ma and Paul Ferguson? Check out his story. He helped deal with all that. And when he was done serving two terms, he retired from politics because you know, served in law, he was no richer at the end of those two terms than he was when he took office. There's something there that's honorable. Covetousness takes people over. That's the benefit of some term limits of some sort because I understand the importance of longevity and the weakness of of turnover, but at the same time, I remember Watts from Oklahoma saying, 
uh, when he stepped out of the political realm. He says, man, we move to Washington thinking it's a cesspool and give us two terms we think it's hot to. So how to choose our leaders wisely? Select from all the people. Select from all the people. Someone from the people. Don't bring in somebody from somewhere else. Someone from the people. When it's time for me to step aside as pastor, I pray that the Lord will have raised up someone from the congregation so that we don't bring in someone from outside. That's where churches have problems with pastoral turnover. That's not happening anytime soon. Well, I was worshiping right there months ago, and these thoughts dropped on me. Just, boop. I wasn't worshiping about that. I was focused on the Lord. And this is what I felt the words were that dropped on me. You're the pastor to your 75, not worry about your replacement to your 75. And then choose your replacement and work with him for two years. And then preach your last sermon as a senior pastor on Pentecost Sunday, 2033. That's the 2000th birthday of the universal church. Like, Lord, that's awesome. Thank you, Lord. But I've questioned since then many times, was that God? Was that not God? Well, it has given me a sword to fight discouragement with. Yeah, yeah so I'm not quitting, folks. <laughs> I'm not discouraged anyway. Proverbs 18, verse 1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. If a guy's a loner, he's isolated from folks, you're not really going to trust him to be a leader because he is determined to be contrary to wisdom. He wants to do his own thing. The Bible says if a man wants to have friends, he should show himself friendly. So if you're part of a congregation, you have no friends, look in the mirror. Am I being friendly? Am I making myself available to fellowship? Did you know fellowship is not shallow? It's something that is spiritual. It's one of the five things the early church was involved in daily. Fellowshipping, friendship, it's important. So select this leader from the people. Someone with the folks. Folks that we're supposed to know those who labor among us. So obviously there were people that would vouch for these men that he chose. Select from all the people, able men. Jesus said, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So a person who has the ability to lead can be trusted with little things. Just little thing. Being a good steward of their own stuff. They keep their car full of trash all the time. Why should they be entrusted to run a, a trucking fleet? They're trash in their own vehicle, right? So faithfulness in little things proves faithfulness in big things. So it's, it's not just the people have ability to do things, but they fall short of it because they're not faithful. Are they able to be faithful? I just can't be faithful. Okay, well, then... Maybe you shouldn't be a judge then. All right. Select from all the people, able men, such as fear God. This is where our wisdom comes from. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So what keeps us honest what keeps us from yielding to temptation to be covetous? What keeps us on our knees when we're tempted to be envy or vindictive or vengeful is the fear of God. We're going to answer to him one day. And so in light of that, I must make good judgment calls. I must. And so this becomes a governing principle in our life. This is Jesus this is Jesus, folks. He's from among the people. He became one of us. He was able, he was faithful in small things. For 30 years, he served his family and worked as a carpenter. Uh, really, he worked as a stonemason. This Greek word means the same thing. There's not many trees in Nazareth. 
So he worked with his hands, reliable, could be trusted. And so good was he that after the resurrection, his family got on board, joined the church, became part of what he started. And obviously he feared his father. He honored his father. He respected his father. He gave his life in submission to the father's will. How to choose wisely? Select from the people, men of truth, men who are not dishonest, men who are not liars. This is Jesus. He said, I am the truth. But we don't get to vote on Jesus, do we? Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. Can I get an amen? Amen. He delights in those who deal truthfully. Sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes I have to hear the truth. Hopefully it's shared with me in love, but sometimes I don't get that luxury. If it's the truth, a hint to the wise should be sufficient. Men of truth. Select from among the people, men of truth who hate covetousness. Covetous people make laws meaningless. Did you know that? They accept bribes because of coveting. This is a problem in a lot of countries in the world where bribery rules a day. Their laws are meaningless because they they have unfaithful men in positions of leadership who are coveters. Proverbs 28, 16, a ruler who lacks understanding is a great oppressor but he who hates covetousness will prolong his days. He'll be less likely to be overthrown or voted out of office if he can keep from becoming corrupt. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. That's the keys to choosing wisely leaders, selecting from all the people, people who are able, able men, such as fear God, men of truth who hate covetousness. Folks, we got a problem. If you watch the news and believe the news, we have a big problem. If you don't believe the news, believe it's all fake and believe other news sources, we got a problem. How do we apply these principles? You look at the men and women that surround these people, their values. The ones that will be an influence. I spent the entire day, Friday, I'm going to make everybody mad, I think. Spent the entire day Friday reading both party platforms. The Democrat platform, 90 pages. The Republican platform, 16 pages if you count the cover page. But jam-packed. Can you say spin, spin, spin? (laughs) So, I didn't read them side by side. I read them one at a time. And I highlighted things I found interesting. And if you were to do the same, devote a day to it. I mean, I'm not a speed reader. Maybe you are, and you can do it in a matter of hours. But I did it in a matter of hours. <laughs> Why should Christians care about governments? Why is this important? Because in our nation, we choose our government leaders. That's why I did what I did. That's why I devoted a day to it. Because I don't want to waste my vote. I don't want to misvote. So we're going to look at the Republican Party platform for 2024, just some excerpts that I highlighted, and the Democratic Party platform, some excerpts that I highlighted. So D comes before R, so sorry, we're going to go first. Democrats will fix the tax system so everyone has a fair shot. This is on page two. We will restore the right to choose. Uh Uh-oh, I don't agree with that. We will continue to bring down costs for families. That's good news. I hope they can do it. Page 26, 
We oppose the use of private school vouchers, tuition tax credits, opportunity scholarships, and other schemes that divert taxpayer-funded resources away from public education. So, you vote that direction, that's the influence that's happening. This is the party's platform, public education all the way. All I got to say about that is, folks, the post office is better because of FedEx and because of UPS. Competition is good. Home Depot is better because of Lowe's. It's just good. In sports, the Cowboys are better. Well, <laughs> sorry, sorry. On page 35, the Democratic Party platform says they're helping to lower energy costs by installing nearly a million solar rooftops in low-income areas by 2029. So that's part of the plan, okay? I found this encouraging. Contrary to what I heard on the fake news or the true news, we need to fund the police, not defund the police. That's good news. Yes, it's good news. So if this party wins on November 5th, it's not the end of the world. Police are not going to be destroyed. All right. Page 46. One of a president's most important duties is appointing the judges who shape our country's laws. Uh Uh-oh. I find that disturbing. I thought they were supposed to interpret the law as it's written in light of the Constitution. But shape. So anyway, they're showing their hand. They're being honest. I appreciate this. All right, page 49. The administration is protecting access to abortion. I don't like that. Including by creating a new path for pharmacies to dispense FDA-approved medication abortion and defending access in court. It is expanding reproductive health care. That's what you call it, reproductive health care, for service members, veterans, and their family members. The administration is defending access to emergency medical care, including clarifying that federal law on emergency care preempts state abortion bans. So I appreciate their honesty. They're being very clear. Okay, page 50. This is what's at play here. With the Democratic Congress, we will pass national legislation to make grow the law of the land again. We will strengthen access to contraception so Every woman who needs it is able to get and afford it. We will protect a woman's right to access IVF. The Republicans are saying that too. We will repeal the Hyde Amendment, which means your tax dollars will be used to fund abortions. We'll continue to support access to FDA-approved medication abortion, appoint leaders at the FDA who respect science, that's respecting science, and appoint judges who uphold fundamental freedoms, the right in the life of your unborn child. Okay. Verse of 56. Verse. (laughs) Page 56. All right. They're being honest. They're telling the truth. That's what we want in government, right? To be told the truth. All right. One of their purposes is protected. They're taking credit for protecting Transgender Americans access to health care and coverage. That's not just health care. That's surgery to change your gender. Medically necessary gender affirming care. Gender affirming. I have a cartoon of a little boy who missed the target with his arrow. So he drew a target around it. That's what gender affirming care is. I am out of alignment with reality, so I'm going to get surgery rather than counseling to make my body be what I imagine I am. Well, I imagine I'm a millionaire. Let's see if the people at the bank will align with my reality. (laughs) All right, the final one, page 57. Democrats will vigorously oppose state and federal bans on gender-affirming health care. That's what that means, sex change. And respect the role of parents. Ah, that's not happening in our country. Families and doctors, not politicians, in making health care decisions. 
That's not happening. Parents are being denied the right to keep their children from transitioning their gender. Basically, medical castration is happening against the parent's will. So there's no mention anywhere in the platform of addressing that issue. So anyway, that is what it is. Now, the Republican Party platform. Chapter, page nine. (laughs) I used to work for tips, so I love this one. Eliminate taxes on tips. Yeah, make America energy independent. Oppose creation of a central bank digital currency. Yes. Now, the Democratic Party platform said nothing at all about creating a central bank digital currency. So it is what it is. So anyway. Page 10. Support the creation of additional, drastically more affordable alternatives to traditional four-year college degree. Can I get an amen? Promote choice and competition in educating your kids and expand access to new affordable health care and prescription drug options. We will protect Medicare and ensure seniors receive the care they need without being burdened by excessive costs. So that's it. The Affordable Care Act is here to say, stay, folks. It is. That's what that is saying. Page 12, to protect Medicare's finances from being financially crushed by the Democrat plan to add tens of millions of new illegal immigrants to the roles of Medicare. Now, all fairness, their platform didn't say that. So if there's inside information, you have to verify if that is their plan. All right, page 13, support universal school choice in every state in America. We will expand 529 education savings accounts and support homeschooling families equally, restore parental rights in education, and enforce our civil rights laws to stop schools from discriminating on the basis of race. Close the Department of Education in Washington, D.C., send it back to the states, and let the states run our educational system as it should be run. Can we say small government? It's just more efficient, more efficient. Page 15. The First Amendment right to religious liberty protects the right not only to worship according to the dictates of conscience, not just the right to worship in your church or your mosque, but also to add in accordance with those beliefs, not just in places of worship, but in everyday life, everywhere you go. Our ranks include men and women from every faith and tradition, and we respect the rights of every American to follow his or her deeply held beliefs. Page 15 again. We proudly stand for families and life. We believe that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States guarantees that no person can be denied life or liberty without due process, and that the states are therefore free to pass laws protecting those rights. We will oppose late-term abortion. That's the strongest statement they have in there. So they have compromise. I'm not happy with that. But it's better than than going to the other extreme. Better than nothing. It's the last page. (laughs) It just keeps coming. A lot was on there. Page 15, we will keep men out of women's sports. Ban taxpayer funding for sex change surgeries. And stop taxpayer-funded schools from promoting gender transition. You know, there are people that regret their transition, and they're being shut out. The story's not being heard. They're pushed off to obscure places like YouTube to tell their story. Well, wouldn't you rather have a a live daughter than a dead son? That's a manipulative lie. Check the statistics. The opposite is probably more true. 
So what do we do? We pray as a citizen. We pray and we do research because God created government for our good and government officials are ministers of God. They're supposed to be. And laws matter. Society cannot function without it. And in our nation, we choose our government leaders. So this message has credibility. I think the church should stay out of politics. No, the church should stay out of dirty politics. Yes. But if you jerk the church out of politics, you silence Martin Luther King. And you silence some of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So to just make a blanket statement is not really thinking things through. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we would hear your voice as citizens and that we would be wise. Lord, I've shared what I know and what I believe. And Lord, your people know and believe what they believe. God, we ask that you would give us leaders. Lord, I pray for the election of 2028, that we would have better choices in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. I want to sing that song about heaven, touch of heaven. Keep in mind, we're not in heaven yet, but we get to taste heaven, right? And regardless of what happens, it's not the end of the world. It's not over till the trumpet sounds and I get an amen. And so God will give us grace to pursue. So don't throw all your eggs in the election basket because it's not worthy of that many eggs. Amen. 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 It's the truth. Don't shoot the messenger for telling the truth. God bless you. Your presence, all oh, noise I sound. Lord, speak to me now. You have all my attention. I will linger and listen. I can't miss a thing.
chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So God's been speaking to me about salt for the last several months. And I've learned a couple of things about salt. And the first thing I'm gonna tell you is we all know it as a preservative, correct? You all say it is salt preserves things. We can pour it on meats and they'll last a lot longer, right? But eventually, they won't last, right? It's not gonna preserve it till the end of time. But at some point, the salt will no longer be effective as a preservative. So what, is, what salt actually does is it slows decay. Wow. I want you to think about that. Salt slows the inevitable decay. And as Christians, we're called to be the salt. We slow the inevitable decay, because we know how this book ends. We know what's coming. But our involvement in all spheres of, of, I don't care if we're talking about government, education, entertainment, all the different spheres, our, our involvement slows the inevitable decay in this world. It's gonna happen, but we slow it down. The second thing I want to talk about is it says, if it loses its flavor, if we lose our flavor, what does that mean? How does salt lose its flavor? Should salt, I mean, they've been digging salt out of the earth for how long? And it's still very salty. Salt loses its flavor when it gets wet. When salt is watered down, it loses its ability to season. Think about that. When we're watered down, we lose our ability to season the world, to make a difference, to make things more palatable. So how do we get watered down? By just inching over a little bit and saying, well, okay, that's all right. You know, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. You know, it's not going to affect me. I'm not going to make a decision to take an abortion pill. But someone we know might. Could be one of your grandkids, one of your kids. When we give in on issues that we know are morally wrong, when we don't, We, when we don't live for the Lord and try to be imitators of Him, we're never going to get it 100%. We don't bring that love into the different spheres in life. We are the salt. And I'm calling you to think about what you are slowing the decay of as you walk through this life. Think about it. That's good. Good. Help us to be more salty, Lord. Amen. To be an influence. Things are better with salt. You have high blood pressure, things are better with Mrs. Dash. But Mrs. Dash doesn't preserve. Yeah. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The peace that is based on the finished works of Christ and not on man's compromises. The eternal peace, the shalom, the wholeness. God bless you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I'd love to meet you if you want to talk some more. Go get them, tigers. Amen.